All right, HMH Unit 3, a Lesson 1 Exploration 2. Uh, this leads into the Modeling Genes Lab as well. So we start Exploration 2 off um, with some text and a question. How is DNA similar to a recipe? A great time to refer back to our DNA model to help out here. Uh, but some ideas that you might come up with um, that a DNA is a recipe for making an organism because uh, a recipe are instructions to making something and DNA are your instructions to your cells to make or do something and if you change a recipe it changes what you make uh, if you add different amounts of flour or sugar in a cake recipe it's going to change the way the cake turns out same with DNA they introduce us to some terms in orange chromosome gene alleles and proteins and the structure of DNA which again we've seen with our model so that kind of helps us get an idea of what's going on in this image. Um, I also mentioned in class the idea of an extension cord. Um, if you take an extension cord and you string it out when you're using it, uh, it takes up a lot of space. But when you're done using it, before you move it, instead of dragging it from one end to the other uh, through the yard, through the house, catch it on things, bang it up, beat it up, you're smart to coil it up. Well, your body does sim there's something very similar. It coils up DNA, and that coiled up DNA was something we call a chromosome. Uh, now, a section of any DNA that is large enough to ch make a change in something, we call a gene. Uh, imagine, again, our model that we made on paper. Let's say that was enough of a sequence of gene to change maybe your eye color uh, or some other trait about you, then it would be the eye color gene. So once you investigate what each of these parts are, they ask us to describe the relationships amongst DNA, chromosomes, and genes. Uh, so DNA is the material that makes up all of those. Genes are just sections of, of DNA, and a chromosome is just coiled up DNA. So they're all made of DNA. They just are different forms or sections, just what part they're referring to. And now we get to the lab. So as you follow this procedure, uh, you're going to need to get these materials. Uh, in the photo online, you see some wooden beans. We have plastic beads. But you need 12 red, 10 yellow in a cup of some sort. You could actually do this with home, at home with some other materials if you want. Some things to point out that a big R means red. So red is dominant. And little r is yellow. It's the recessive trait. Nature just made it that way in this case. And the first thing they ask us is, what are the genotypes? So we should make clear that genotypes means what are the letters? What are the actual genes it's getting? And phenotype means what is it actually going to look like? So in this table, we filled in under red uh, two big R's. That's one way to get a red. And a big R and a little r. That's another way to get a red. The only way to get yellow is if you end up with two little r's. So in terms of beads, you can get uh, two red beads to make a red. You could get a red bead with a yellow bead. That would still make a red since red dominates over yellow. And then the only way to get yellow is two yellow beads. And they take us through the scenario. And um, here we fill out. I have the chart already filled in uh, with letters which are the beads I drew, and the phenotypes are the words that they're actually going to be. And I've got a section of video uh, to watch in how I actually did that. If you're, un if you're not familiar with how I got this table filled in, uh, be sure to watch the follow-up part about me drawing beads out of a cup. HMH Unit 3, Lesson 1, Exploration 2, Modeling Genes. Uh, so this is a quick overview of how I actually got the results you see in the review. So in that cup, you see 12 red beads and 10 yellow beads. And in the procedure, they have you draw out pairs of beads that represent fish. So you can see in the first case, I pulled out two red beads. Uh, in the second case here, you see me pull out two yellow beads. Um, as, you f as you check in the chart as we fill this in, so red bead's going to represent a capital R. It's dominant uh, R for red. Uh, and the lowercase r will be yellow. So the first pairing you saw me place would be represented as a big R, big R, and it would be a red fish. The second one you saw me put down, little r, little r, for a yellow bead, yellow bead, and that would be a yellow fish. And then you see a big r, little r, or red, yellow bead, which would also be a red fish. Uh, then you see a pair of yellows, little r, little r, and that would be a yellow fish. Uh, then you see a red and a yellow, which would be a red fish, big R, little r. And then in the second column that I start, we get two red beads, so big R, big R, which makes a red fish. 
You see now me placing a red bead and a yellow bead, so a big R, a little R, which would be a red fish. I then place, uh, draw out a yellow and a yellow, which is a little R, little R, yellow fish. Uh, here I get big R, big R, or red and red, which makes a red fish. And I get another red yellow combination, so big R, little R on the table, and that makes a red fish. And my final pair you see are uh, red, red again, so big R, big R, or red fish. So this is the procedure in part one of how you draw the fish beads. Okay, and then we'll follow up with part two in a moment. Once that it's done, they have a scenario in which they say algae, a reddish colored algae is growing in the habitat with these fish. And because a predator would then see the yellow fish better than the red fish, they might get picked off. And so they have you remove three yellow fish from the population. And since a fish is made up of two beads, in this case a yellow fish, therefore made of two yellow beads, you would have to pull three pairs of yellow out or six yellow beads. So I pull those out of the cup. And then again, I've got a video of me going over this. You should watch it at the end if you need it, uh, in which I pull beads out now with 12 red beads in the cup and only four yellow beads. And these are the fish that I get. Okay, now for part two, um, in which they have you remove beads. Uh, so in this scenario, they talk about uh, there's red algae growing and that the yellow fish stand out. So you're going to remove the alleles for three yellow fish. And since each fish is made up of two beads, uh, that's going to mean six yellow beads are pulled out of the population. So now you'll see me reloading the cup as instructed in the procedures. And this leaves me with 12 red beads and only four yellow beads. And we go through the same procedure in drawing out pairs of beads. So in this case, second time around, the second chart, I've pulled out a red and yellow, so a big R, little r, which would make a red fish. And here I have a red and a yellow again, a big R for the red, a little r for the yellow, since it's recessive, which would make a red fish. Here we have a big R, big R pair, or double red beads, that would make a red fish. Here we have a big R, little r, or red and then yellow bead, so another red fish. And we get another red pair, big R, big R, red in the table. Uh, again, big R, big R, red in the table. The final two pairs, we have red and red again, and which makes a big R, big R, red. And finally, a big R, little r, or red bead, yellow bead, red fish. So there we have the second uh, scenario in which the red algae dominates and the poor yellow fish are picked off and uh, that's what's left. Okay. Now for the analysis part. Uh, compare and contrast the first and generation phenotypes. In other words, the first table to the second table. And we got more red than yellow in both generations. But there are yet less yellow in the second generation than the first, which would make sense because you have less yellow beads available to make little fish. Uh, the numbers of red outnumber the numbers of yellow even more in the second generation. Okay, predict what would happen after many generations. Well, if yellow kept being removed from the population, uh, you would expect less yellow beads or um, that trait to be present. So I would guess over time that all the fish would end up red. You might even eliminate all of the yellow genes completely. So suppose that a yellow algae started to grow. Well, you can imagine the same scenario only reversing it or flipping it to where the yellow fish survive and the red fish are picked off. So my prediction might be that um, you would be pulling out red beads instead of yellow. So those six yellow beads that we pulled out, we would then pull out six red beads, make crosses. I would expect more yellow fish to be common. And over time, eventually uh, producing a lot of yellow fish. Okay. Now we move on. They ask us one question about mutation. Now mutation can happen in a number of ways, but for our sake, Think about your model that you built and the sequence of letters. Imagine if any one of those letters were changed. We would call that a mutation. Uh, and in this case, we have a mutation that doesn't affect the offspring. So mutations, if you read the text, tell you that some rare mutations can help the next generation, the offspring. Most of them are harmful. 
uh, to the point often where the it, it can even be fatal to the offspring. And then a lot of them just don't really do anything. You don't even notice them. So in this case, a mutation that does not affect the protein that the gene codes for, what do you expect? I would expect you probably wouldn't be able to tell at all by looking at the phenotype, right? The, it's still going to be made of the same stuff. The instructions are still the same. Even though in the genetic code, there is a slight you know, change that could be passed on later on. It could eventually, you know, more mutations could build up and enough to where you do see a change in the phenotype. Uh, so that is the end of Exploration 2.